That's how you change the world. Amen. You may be seated. Let's turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 6, the uh, 6th chapter of Romans, as we continue our journey through God's Word. Last week in chapter 5, Paul outlined nine different blessings that are bestowed upon those of us who are justified by faith. Number one, he said, we have peace with God. Number two, we've been given unlimited access to God. Number three, we've been given the confidence of the glory of God. I'm confident in my salvation. Number four, we've been given the ability to glory and rejoice even in tribulation. Number five, the the blessing that Christ died for the ungodly, which means that everyone is qualified for salvation. Number six, we have been spared. We have been removed from God's wrath. Blessing number seven, we have been reconciled unto a holy God. Number eight, we rejoice in God. My joy is based on one who never changes. Number nine, the greatest blessing of all, eternal life. All of eternity, God has given us to praise and to worship the Lamb of God. So all of this, just simply for being justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And the message that Paul continues to stress over and over again is that you cannot be justified by works. You can't go to heaven for being a good person. One of the hardest things for for us as Christians to grasp is that your justification is not based on how much or how little we sin. Paul said in chapter 5, where sin abounds, grace abounds, not much, but not more, but much more. So your sins are justified simply by your faith. Now, we come here to chapter 6. And Paul has spent five chapters trying to get that concept of grace and justification by faith through our thick skulls here. But once he's gotten that message to to penetrate, now what he's going to do is he's going to give us a warning. He's going to let us know that we can never mistake the fact that, that God is so gracious that it gives me a license to sin. A warning to those who have now grasped the message of grace, but then approach life in in terms of walking with the Lord with the attitude of, because of God's grace and because of God's favor, I can go out and and sin as much as I want to without any uh, consequences because God is good. And Paul's going to illustrate here that we can never mistake God's grace as an entitlement to pursue the things of the flesh. We begin here in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then of course he answers his own question. Certainly not. Paul is presenting the gospel. He's laying out Christianity here to the reader. And he's posing a, a rhetorical question. He's saying, is this Christianity? Is this This salvation based on grace, justification by faith, is Christianity something where once I believe it and accept it, do I then continue in my old lifestyle in order that God can keep forgiving me so so He gets the glory? And Paul answers that question, certainly not. In the King James, it's a stronger language. It says, God forbid. That is not the description of, of a Christian life. It says, How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And in verse 3, Or do you not know, and circle that word know, or just remember it, because there's going to be a, a pattern here. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? That's what baptism represents. When you are being submerged under the water, It's a proclamation. It it declares to the world that the old man, the old person that you were before Christ, the sinner, has died, has been buried with Christ. And it says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, 
that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so when you're baptized and you're raised back up out of the water, it represents a new life that springs forth. A new life in Christ, whereas before you lived and were under the the bondage of sin. You lived as a person who was doomed for destruction. But that guy, once you've been saved, once once you've gone through that baptism, what it represents is that guy has been put to death. No longer under the bondage of sin. This new life in Christ springs up out of the water. A new life that's victorious over death. Victorious over sin. You're a new creation. You're a new life. You've been given victory through Jesus Christ over everything that that old man represented. The man that was headed for destruction is buried and gone. And Paul is asking, why would you want to go back and dig him up? Once you have experienced grace, once you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, how can you then desire your old life of sin? Listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 21 and 22. He says, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn turn from the holy commandments delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, A dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Pretty strong words. A a born again Christian returning to his former life of sin. Paul likens it to digging up a, a dead man. And Peter compares it to a dog who goes back and laps up his own vomit. Paul says we should walk like that person who was raised up out of the water, victorious. Not like that dirty, filthy man that you just buried. Walk in the newness of life. In verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. And then in verse 6, here's that word again, No. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he has died, for he who has died, has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And a life that lives as Christ lives, victorious over death, victorious over sin, is a life that lives to God. We think about God's grace. And the whole theme of the book of Romans is grace. It's it's a study of God laying out to mankind his plan of salvation through grace. What I want you to know this morning is not only does God's marvelous grace provide us with salvation, it also provides us with the ability to live lives that are victorious over sin. Grace equips you with the power to live a different kind of life than you lived before. A lot of times we we, we think of grace as being one-dimensional. Grace is for when I fall, it's for when I sin, when I need forgiveness, and that's true. But what you need to know is that grace not only saves you from the penalty of sin, it saves you from the power of sin, the draw that it has on your life. You do not have to be a slave to sin. God will deliver you if you'll just let Him. If if you haven't been able to to get a handle on your sin, then I suggest that you get yourself out of the way and let God show you how it's done. Again, Paul, when when he said, 
where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. As true as that statement is, he was concerned that the the reader, the people, would take God's grace and make it one-dimensional. He was concerned that people would think, well, I can sin as much as I want then, and God will be glorified. Because as the world sees what a scumbag I am, it makes God look all the more gracious because he keeps forgiving me. And if grace were one-dimensional, then I guess that would make sense. But Paul's not going to let us get away with that kind of thinking. Because what he's declaring to us today, again, is that grace not only saves you from the penalty of sin, it also equips you with the ability to withstand the power of sin. And so, God is glorified by forgiving me through His grace, but perhaps even more glorified because of that same grace. The fact that that same grace, once I'm forgiven, that grace more than supplies me with the the strength to endure and not to be driven by my flesh. God's grace also gives me the power to live consecrated unto the Lord. So Paul, what he's doing here is simply defending what he's just shared in the first five chapters. He's defending justification by faith against the charge that it encourages sin. Because many religious leaders then and and now, they believe that you have to keep people under guilt. You have to keep people afraid. You got to whip them into submission. And if you go out and tell everybody that that God's grace is greater than their sin, well then you're just handing out sin licenses. People are going to be out of control. But Paul is saying is, is that justification by faith in the heart of a person who has truly embraced it will not use grace for an excuse to sin. He will use grace as a means to overcome sin. And just because you've been forgiven, just because God has forgiven you, we should never make the mistake of thinking that that God is lax or lenient on sin. God deals with sin very harshly. So what a cruel God He would be if He only gave us enough grace for forgiveness of our sins, but then provided us with no power or ability to live better than we did before. I mean, we'd be saved, but we'd still be living in bondage. We'd still have no power to overcome our flesh. When I came to the Lord, when I got saved, yeah, I wanted to be forgiven. I wanted to, I wanted to go to heaven. But I also wanted to be delivered from the lifestyle that I was leading, a lifestyle that, it, that was causing me nothing but pain and heartache. And pain uh, to those around me. I hated how I was treating people. I hated how I was spending my time. I hated the person I was becoming. I wanted a different life. I wanted something more than what the world had to offer. And so God didn't just, he didn't, he didn't save me and then just throw me back to the wolves and say, okay, do the best you can. He equips us with the ability to live victorious Christian lives. And therefore, the Bible talks about how it is impossible for God to come into a human life and that life not to be changed. And listen, I'm not God. I'm not the judge of who's saved and I'm not the judge of who's going to heaven and who's not. But if a person claims that they've accepted the Lord when they were 8 years old or or 18 years old or 28 years old, but then there's been no change in their life, no change in their behavior, then something's wrong. That's exactly what James calls a, a dead faith. Faith without works is dead. Meaning, we don't work for our salvation, but once you've received salvation, once God comes into your life, then that should be reflected in your behavior. And if it's not, then something's wrong. And James is simply saying that the world should be able to determine your faith based on the way you act. You can call yourself an apple tree. But the world has a very good way of determining whether that's true or not. 
Because an apple tree is only going to bear what? Your actions, the way you live is always going to be an indicator of your faith to the rest of the world. And if you're here today and you say, well, I accepted the Lord in Sunday school a long time ago when I was eight years old. But you've continued to live like hell ever since. Again, I'm not God, but I wouldn't bank on that for eternal life if it were me. Because it is impossible for God to come into your heart and not change it. And my suggestion here is that if you consider yourself a Christian, but there's been no change in your heart, there's been no change in your lifestyle, you, you, you continue, you still live to please your flesh just as much as you did before, then perhaps God has never resided in your heart at all. And that's between you and Him. But, but, but think about this. I've had the honor of, of baptizing quite a few people in the last year and a half. But think about what baptism represents. Now, you don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. But just think about what it represents. If grace was for forgiveness only, because there are people who, who live, Christians who still live defeated lives because they, they still live under the bondage of sin. Now God has forgiven me, but God has provided me no power to continue living righteously. And it's just not true. If, if, if God had intended for, for grace to be one-dimensional, and this is what baptism would represent. This is what baptism would look like if grace gave you no ability in your life. God was okay with you continuing in your life of sin once you're saved. Baptism would just be, I, I, I'd, I'd take you down into the water and, and you and I would be standing there and, and, I, and I'd say to you, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and then I would, I would take you down in the water and then I would just hold you there and I would keep you there until the thrashing stops. We laugh, but, but how many people still live like the dead person that just, they just buried? God didn't intend for you to continue living like a dead man. The Bible says you were dead in your sins. But you spring up out of the water. A new life. Paul says live like it. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Don't continue living like the dead man or woman. Verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word reckon is an accounting term. It means you, you compute or you calculate to determine what is fact. If you want to balance your checkbook, you add up all of the deposits and then you add up all of the withdrawals. And at the end, if it tells you then that, that you have $100, then you've reckoned that you have $100. It's fact. That's what you have. And Paul says that's what you have to do in regards to your old lives of sin. Not suppose, but reckon. Establish it as fact that we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. In verse 12, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Don't allow sin to have or occupy the place in your life that it once did. And so here's a great lesson in verses 11 and 12. What does it tell us? It tells us any power that sin has in my life today, it's the only power that I choose to give it. Sin has no power over me other than what I allow. In verse 13, And do not present your members, the, the parts of your body, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 
I pray every day, God, give me the opportunity to touch someone's life today in the name of Jesus. But what Paul's saying here is an even better way to pray each day. It's more specific. God, I present my hands to you. Use them as you see fit. I present my ears to you. Speak to me, God. God, I present my feet to you today. Take me wherever you'd have me go. Whereas once we use the members of our bodies, as Paul says, as instruments of unrighteousness, we are to now present ourselves, every part of us, as instruments of righteousness for God. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And, and, and that's important. That's an important point Paul is making. Because those who seek to live under the law, the legalists, the, the self-righteous, they are the ones that continue to live in the bondage of sin. Because all the law does is reveal sin. It can't justify sin. And you're going along pretty good and you're thinking, well, I'm doing pretty good at being pretty good. Look in the mirror. Like, well, I'm, I'm all right. I compare myself to everybody else. I'm, I'm pretty good. I don't, I don't sin. And then one day, boom, you fall. It hits you. The law reveals to you your unrighteousness. The suddenly, the one you depended on for righteousness, you depended on the law for righteousness because you were a legalist. But now that one you depended on for righteousness has turned on you. What you thought was your friend has become your foe. And seeking to live a life justified by works, being a person who is legalistic, is like having a mountain lion for a house pet. You know, he might cuddle up with you for a little while, but eventually he's going to turn on you. And now, having no justification for your sin because the law can't justify, your guilt and your shame draws you deeper and deeper into sin. And it happens over and over and over again. And it's because the law could never provide you with the power to overcome sin. Only grace, only God's marvelous grace can guide you through the process of sanctification. Step by step, from glory to glory, as you walk in victory, becoming more Christ-like every passing day. That's the power of grace. The law of Moses can never provide this power in a human life, only grace. And so Paul says, once you presented yourself to sin, we're not to continue down that path. We now present ourselves to God and for His purpose. And it's an important thing to do every single day, every single day when you wake up, God, I present myself to you. Paul's later going to write in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Paul says it's the least we can do. In verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Again, God forbid. Certainly not. And now beginning here in verse 16 and throughout the rest of the chapter, in order to drive home his point, Paul's going to use the concept of slavery. He says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the ones slaves whom you obey? Do not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the ones slaves whom you obey. And whether you know it or not, every single person in this room today is a slave. Everyone serves something or someone. We all worship something. It can be sin, sex, drugs, rock and roll, 
It can be another person. It can be your own intellect, your own ideas about life and eternity and all. It can be philosophy, someone else's ideas about life. But the point is, every single person is a slave. Every single person is a servant. And Paul here gives us the identifier. Here's how you will know who you are a slave to. Who do you obey? Who do you obey? What in life snaps its finger and you come running? Is it your self-will? Is it your flesh? Your sex drive? Your pride? Is it vanity? I'm going to make myself throw up. I'm going to deny myself proper nutrition because I'm trying to live up to what the world says is beautiful. Who do you obey? Is it the voice of God? Is it the Holy Spirit? Because whatever you obey, according to Paul, that's who your master is. It says, whether of sin leading to death or of disobedience leading to righteousness, you choose who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, and that's important, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And why it's important is, and what we need to recognize here, and it's kind of the theme to today's message, is that for every child of God, notice, slavery to sin is spoken of in the past tense. We are no longer slaves to sin. And the evidence of that is a life that is obedient unto God. It says, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So not only has Jesus set me free from the slavery of my sin, he has given me the ability and the power to now pursue righteousness. And now in verse 19, Paul says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness to the, to the degree that you did that, he says, and lawlessness, lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So the same degree that once I pursued my flesh, I am now to pursue holiness and righteousness. We see it all the time. People just living disgusting, vile, sinful lives and then they come to the Lord and man they just do a complete 180 and it's a beautiful thing Paul says that's the way it's supposed to be when I met my wife you've heard me say before man she had a mouth like a sailor like a truck driver <laughs> not that I was much better it's just it 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 it, 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 it took me back because how could such filth come out of the mouth of a pretty little girl is what I was thinking. But she didn't, she didn't, she didn't think anything of it because it's who she was. It, it was her background. It was just kind of where she came from. But then, God. And the transformation in her life was nothing short of miraculous. Holy Spirit changed from the inside out. And that same tongue that used to spew profanities for the last 16 years has only been used to sing praises to God. I wrote a song. It's on her CD, the first song. And I wrote that song with that in mind, just thinking of, of knowing her heart now knowing her heart since she had come to Christ in the last 16 years that she spent her life worshiping the Lord. And there's a line in there that I wrote with that in mind. and It said, I just thought about the tongue and the way she used it before. But it says, if I had a thousand tongues, I know she'd use them all to say hallelujah, 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 sing praises to the Lord. Paul says, be just as zealous for righteousness 
as you were for sin. However fast and hard you ran for sin, run for God. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? What do you have to show for all of the the sins and, and for all of the vile things that you've done in your past? He says, for the end of those things is death. Verse 22, but now, past tense, having been past tense, set free from sin and having become past tense, slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. Becoming a slave to God, here's what you get. You get a life of holiness. You get a life that's victorious over sin. And then for good measure, becoming a slave to God, cherry on top, God throws in everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. So every person is a slave, and those who are a slave to sin, eventually, payday comes. Sin's going to want to get paid. And it's a hefty price tag. The wages of sin is death. And not just death in this life. It's even more tragic than that. It's death for eternity. Death in the spiritual. Death in the life to come. But Jesus, Paul says, came to free you from all that. He came and he paid your debt. He settled your score with death and sin. But you have to make him your master. You can't be a slave to Jesus Christ and be a slave to sin. You can't serve two masters. And that's the problem with most people in the church today. They want to try and seek God. They want some semblance of church. But not at the cost of denying themselves any fleshly indulgence. And of course you have the churches now pandering to that. We don't talk about sin anymore. We don't talk about hell anymore. Mel and I, there was a church back home in Las Vegas that we were friends with the pastor. Barbecued quite a few times. Their church was was awesome. They taught the word of God and um, very anointed. And we talked to some people over the weekend and, and now they've decided to take a different direction. They want to try to bring in more people and, and now they don't, they, don't, they don't talk about sin. They don't sing about sin. They don't talk about hell. They don't sing about the blood of Jesus. They don't talk about it. Because it's not what's attractive to the world. And what a shame it is. That's not going to happen here. People want the grace that saves their soul without the grace that leads to righteous living. And you can't separate the two. So Paul says there are no excuses for God's people not to live victorious Christian lives. In this chapter, Paul laid out four keys to a life of holiness, a life that is being sanctified, set apart. Four words that Paul uses that when applied in your life will equip you with the ability to keep sin where it belongs, under lock and key. The words are four words. No, K-N-O-W, Reckon, present, and slave. He says in verse 3, To know that when you were baptized into Christ Jesus, that you were also baptized into His death. 
He says in verse 6, we are to know that because we were crucified with him, that our body of sin is done away with. We should no longer be slaves of sin. And then in verse 9, he says, know that Christ has been raised from the dead and that death no longer has dominion. The second word is reckon. Reckon means to accept something as fact. In verse 11, Paul says, I need to accept as fact that I am dead to sin. I have victory over sin. And that doesn't mean that my sin has been completely annihilated. I still have to live in this corrupt body. But it does mean that my sin has been rendered inactive. It has been paralyzed. It has no power over me except for the power that I give it. In order for sin to reign in my life, I have to go resuscitate it. And those two things, those two words, know and reckon, handle the, the mental side, the cerebral, the thinking part. I am to know that I have been crucified with Christ and I am, I am to accept as fact that my former life of sin is out of commission. And once you've got that, the next two words are from a more practical perspective. If I've got my mind straight, then this is what I do. The third word is present. Verse 18 says, Present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. We all know what we did with the members of our body before we came to Christ. But what about now? Do your feet walk in righteousness or do, do they take you to the same dark places where you used to hang out? What about your eyes and ears? What, what are you watching on television? What kind of movies are you going to? What do you listen to on the radio? The point is, has anything changed or are you still subjecting your eyes and ears to the, the same filth that you knew before Christ? What comes out of your mouth? Are you singing praises to God on Sunday and then using profanity on Monday? You've heard the phrase, you kiss your mother with that mouth? How about, do you praise God with that mouth? What about your hands? Are you using your hands to build God's kingdom or Satan's? Present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. And finally, the fourth word is slave. Paul uses it eight times between verses 15 and verses 23. What am I a slave to? Who is my master? This is all about settling the issue of lordship in your life. Am I going to serve my flesh or am I going to serve Jesus Christ? Is Jesus a part of my life or is he my entire life? Am I taking my relationship with him as the single most important thing on earth? Or am I just going to continue to play this cat and mouse game where sometimes I'm in, sometimes I'm out. I'm hot, I'm cold. I want to serve God, but I want to continue in sin as well. The problem is, you can only serve one master and you're never going to break free from your life of sin until you settle the issue of lordship in your life. Jesus refuses to be just a part of your life. You've heard, if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. You can only have one Lord. You can only have one master. Paul says, you have to choose. Who's it going to be? Know that you are crucified with Christ. Reckon that your old life of sin is a thing of the past. Present yourselves as a slave of righteousness and settle once and for all the issue of lordship in your life. Who are you going to serve? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just pray now. I know, Lord, I just pray every day that you'll search my heart. God, that you will remove anything, Lord, that takes me away from you, even one inch away from you. God, I want my life to be all about you. I want everything that I do, my hands, my feet, my eyes, ears, my mouth, I want every member of my body, God, to, to be a, a, a tool, an instrument of glory for you. God, sanctify us. God, set us apart. Give us lives. Help us, Lord, to live lives that are pleasing to you. 
That when people see us, when the world look at us and they, and they see us, God, that they see you. And they say, there goes a person who loves Jesus Christ. Whether they believe it or not, they can't deny my love for you. God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that your, your grace doesn't just save us and then leave us just kind of uh, flopping around like a fish. God, your grace supplies us with the power to live a life that's pleasing to you. Help us to tap into that grace every single day. What a powerful, powerful tool you've given us. And so God, we just thank you for the way you love us. We thank you, God, for the way you provide for us. Every single need, God, you are there. We offer this day to you. And we praise you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need prayer, if you never accepted the Lord, I can love to pray with you afterwards. Uh, again, don't forget about uh, Ignite Youth tonight and Men's and Women's Bible Study. Uh, we're going through the book of Philippians. Uh, Wednesday night, our midweek services again will be in this week in chapter 6. A uh, lot of, lot of fun stuff in chapter 6 with, the, <laughs> with the, the Nephilim, the giants and all that kind of stuff. And so some interesting, interesting scripture. Uh, and we'll see how far we get there. Maybe we'll get through chapter 7 as well. But uh, come out Wednesday night at uh, 7 p.m. Next week, Romans chapter 7. And uh, may you just have a blessed and, and glorious week. Stay warm out there. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Let's uh, stand and worship.